All right, so last time we were in the middle of covering uh, finding volumes of solids of revolution in, um, in using the shell method. So last time we finished the disc washer and cross sectionals as well. And well, so this time for the shell method, well, we already did a couple of examples. We did one in which the axis of rotation, which is vertical, the horizontal, the direction of the rotation is horizontal in this case. And in that situation, we use functions of x. So in this case, uh, it's worth noting, and let me do that, let me rephrase this again. Uh, okay, so it's not working. Yeah. It's worth noting that um, rotating about a vertical axis need functions. And this is the this is as opposed to the disc washer method. We rotate about a horizontal axis. We use functions of x. We do, we rotate about a vertical axis. Is functions of y. It's the reverse in here for for the rotate for for this kind of rotation. And in this case, uh, let's find the volume. For example, number three, find the volume of a solid obtained when rotating the region bounded by y equals square root of x. Okay, let's start. By, by plotting the graph. Okay, square root of x, the x-axis, that is y equals to zero, the horizon, this horizontal line, and x equals to four. All right, so that's x equals to four, but in this case, we want to rotate this about the x-axis. That's gonna give rise to the following solid. Okay, which is going to look sort of like this. Let's try and make this look like a solid. I think this one is okay to make it look solid. All right. Well, so number one, let's write down the formula to find. Um, oh, number one, another note. when rotating about a horizontal <coughs> axis need functions of y. But in this case we're given all functions of x, not functions of y. All right, so we're gonna need some information first. So number one, in this case, well, our function, which is y equals the square root of x, this is the same as saying x equals y squared, which happens to be this function, all right? Then this is x equals to four, and in this case, well, the rotation will go about this, just like that, all right? So again, um, sticking to the example, the lollipop example, what do we have? We have like a sideways lollipop, which is, which has a, well, the stick of the candy, it stick to the candy in this case, and this is, the, this is gonna be the shape of the candy that's gonna be in this case, the rightmost minus leftmost, which in a way, it's the height of the shape of the ball. Given that we have a horizontal shape, the height is really the length, and that's gonna be the rightmost minus leftmost, and the distance right here from uh, from the outermost point in the shape of the rotation to the axis, that's gonna be x, or not x rather, because in this case it's vertical, it's y, 
minus zero because zero is the actual position of the axis of rotation or again like the stick of the lollipop is in that location well so let's see when we set up the integral that's going to be volume equals to pi integral from c to d not from a to b because we're using functions of y that's uh, r of y h of y dy okay now to verify the consistency of this unit well this is r a radius centimeters for example this is a height centimeters and this dy it's also a length centimeters so what do we have centimeters and centimeters and centimeters isn't that centimeter cubed so this should be represent volume all right okay so that r of y that'll be volume equals to 2 pi integral from c to d what about the limits of integration well uh, this point right here which one of the points of intersection will be the point zero comma zero that's the origin and we need to find the other point of intersection that is between the curve and the vertical line that is when x equals to four we need to find the value of y and we can do it by plugging in the formula for y equals the square root of x which is the square root of four that's going to be two and we need these points of intersection as order pairs because in this case we're not going to um, we're not going to integrate from a to b which is the limits in the direction of x but rather in the direction of y all right so that's going to go from zero to two in this case and well the radius is y units y minus zero units times the height which in this case is four minus y squared that's the rightmost the rightmost function of, of y minus the leftmost which in this case is the sideways parabola with respect y and while this integral should be relatively easy to compute um, that's an integral from 0 to 2 that's y times 4 minus y squared with respect y and all we need here is to distribute that's 4y minus y squared with respect to y and well we can integrate these two terms individually just using the general power rule that'll be 2 pi hmm? which one? Oh yeah it should be cubed cubed thank you mm -hmm. cubed and that's 2 pi okay the integral of 4y that's 4y squared over 2 minus y to the fourth over 4 all this from 0 to 2 which which is great that we have one of the limits to be 0 to reduce calculation times all right so this will be 2 pi that reduces to 2y squared minus y to the fourth over 4 from 0 to 2 okay so 2 pi that's going to be 2 times 2 squared minus 2 to the 4 over 4 minus well what happens when we plug in 0 for these two terms do we agree that this is going to be just a big 0 here yep okay that's valid on the test on our quiz that's valid but again if you prefer to have all the calculation by all means okay so that's going to be well 2 pi so 2 square which is 4 times 2 that's 8 minus 2 to the 4 which is 16 over 4 16 over 4 is that a 4? 8 minus 4 that's 4 4 times 2 pi 8 pi all right all right so again uh, because so section 6.5 so uh, luckily lucky for us Again, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the semester, we are no longer covering section 6.5 on finding the work done by a variable force and by integration, which is really not that, not like, a, like the hardest section ever, but uh, I mean, it, it, anyway, you're going to do this in your physics courses when you take those classes. And, um, and I mean, all the units and how to set up the integrals was most likely, I mean, was more, 
most importantly, the, the biggest point here. So we're going to move to the average value of a function. So let's look at the definition and how about we take, uh, how about we backtrack to calculus one because I think it's, it's going to be a really, really good analogy for what we're going to do in this very brief section. So we don't have to go very in depth. We're going to do one example to verify the result. So you might remember from calculus one, a very important definition. Oh, this is too big. Uh, it's called the mean value theorem. All right. So, mean value theorem. You call that MVT for short. Okay. Well, what's the mean value theorem? Well, in my own words, I call it where where the calculus meets the algebra. So where, where, where do I go? What, where am I going with that? Number one, where the slope of the secant is equal to the slope of the tangent. So the idea is that, well, if we consider a secant line on a function f of x, well, number one, What's the, what's a secant line? What's the definition of a secant line? Anyone? Yeah, well, that's where we're going to get to, but I mean, just, just a secant line in, in geometric terms. What is it? Yeah. It's a line that touches the function twice. So it touches twice, right? And let, let's say at this point here and a point right there, right? So that's a secant line. So slope, no, actually, let me call it secant. And well, that slope between the point A and B, all right? And well, the mean value theorem is a the was a theorem to find a value of C between A and B, and it doesn't have to be exactly in the middle between A and B, but somewhere in between, for which the slope is exactly the same, the slope rather, the slope of the tangent is exactly the slope of the secant line. Well, between A, in, in this trajectory, in this curved segment, we can trace in practically infinitely many tangent line, but we're interested in one tangent line in particular, one tangent line that has the same steepness or slope than the secant line. You know, let's call this C. And as you can see from the picture, that value of C is not exactly right in the middle, but it could be the case. So, well, now let's put symbols to this. What's this? How do we find the slope of a secant line? Okay, so notice in this case for the secant line we have two points. So what can we do with those two points? Y over y2 minus y1. So if we call this, for example, p1 and p2, x1, y1, x2, x2, y2. So the slope between those two points, that's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? That's the algebra part. We learned that in algebra, but then in calculus we learn how to find the slope not of the, uh, not of the average, or rather not of the secant, which is the average, but rather the tangent in this case. Which again, from the beginning of the semester in Calc 1, we discussed how the average change versus instantaneous change. In this case, this is the average change, this will be the instantaneous change. But now, how do we find the slope of a tangent line? That's the question. Take the derivative of f and evaluate it at c in this case, which is this value right here for which the slope, which will be the exact same as that of the secant line. So that was the, uh, the, the average value or the mean value theorem for derivatives, right? When the slope of the secant, which is found 
using calculus, I mean using algebra is equal to the slope of the tangent that's done found doing calculus. Now, there is an analogy between this mean value theorem with the average value of a function, which you can think of a, of the absolute, I'm not absolute, of the average value or the mean value theorem for integrals, and we're going to consider um, the same region, why not? From A to B, alright? So that's B, that's A. Well, what happens when we plug in A in the function right here? Well, this is going to give us F of A. When we do the same with the value B, this is going to output our F of B. All right? Well, the integral right here is going to represent the area under the curve, right? That's by definition of the integral. Again, no need to go through all the details that we have, that you have done in calculus one that we also reviewed here briefly in calculus two. Well, so in this case, this is another where calculus meets algebra again, but in this case for integrals, not for derivatives. So in this case, uh, we are going to look for a value c, f of c, all right? Not exactly the one, not exactly in the middle, but could be in the middle, such that the funky looking area equals the area of a rectangle. So what's the picture here? Well, so again, we do this with calculus, we do this with algebra, I mean no need to integrate to find the area of a rectangle because all we do length times width, right? No need, no need, no need for calculus. But what's the picture here? So, uh, suppose this area right here is peanut butter. Alright, what am I going to do with this peanut butter? Well, I have a knife here. I have a knife and I'm going to uh, modify the shape of the peanut butter here. I'm going to push this down. I'm going to pull this up a little bit and I'm going to push this down until I get a perfectly rectangular shape which is going to be basically this one. This horizontal line right here will be that average value of the function, which is denoted actually F average. And that, and to calculate that average value, it's no other than computing the integral, which is the area under the curve, and divide by the length of the interval, which in this case by B minus A. Well, uh, right now, maybe with the picture, it, it may not be that clear, but it will be clearer when we do an example. And I'm going to do a very, a very brief example. So, find the average value of the function f of x equals x squared plus 1 on the interval negative 1 to 2. So, let's graph this parabola. Uh, it's a parabola shifted up one unit. So, that means the y-intercept 0 to 1. And then from negative 1, 2, 1, 2, and 2, 5. Alright. So, and then from here. So we're going to find this area. Between negative 1 and 2. And well, this is what we're going to do next. We are going to find negative 1, 1, and 2. We are going to find this value of y, that is the top of the rectangle, such that the area under the parabola is exactly equal to the area under the rectangle. So, the value of C, if we will, such that 
whatever we do with calculus it's equal to whatever we do with just arithmetics or algebra in the same way we did it with the slopes for the mean value theorem so the value of c for which the slope of the secant is equal to the slope of the tangent so that's the picture for this how about we compute this well so that's going to be f average equals 1 over b minus a integral from a to b f of x with respect x so that's 1 over 2 minus negative 1 and careful with the negative signs so that's good that's going to go from negative 1 to 2 of f of x oh not f of x actually x squared plus 1 with respect x so 1 over 2 minus negative 1 that's going to give us a 1 third and well let's integrate this that's going to be x cubed over 3 plus x and this evaluated from negative 1 to 2 by the way the quantity that we will evaluate without multiplying the, by the one third that's going to be the area under the curve that's only the integral portion of the problem let me let me highlight this so this is what I'm highlighting here is this area right here right it's going to be the calculation over here without the one third the one by multiplying by the one third well, what we're going to obtain is that average value and it's important so you can see the picture to check the consistency with the definition and the pictures we drew above so well so that's a one-third uh, that's um, 2 cubed over 3 plus 2 minus negative 1 cubed this a little bit negative 1 cubed over 3 plus negative 1 all right and well for the sake of time I will give you the value inside of the brackets the value inside of the brackets will be 6 all right but again this number inside of the parentheses now we used to be brackets what does that 6 represent again it's just the area under the curve this this area right here right okay so what is 6 over 3 in this case 2 that means that f average equals to 2 the line y equals to 2 1 2 okay let's verify the definition with what we have here so how many how many units long is this rectangle so 3 and what about the height Two. What is two, three times two? Isn't that the same area as the one under the curve? So that's the that, that's the average value. It could have been six. It could have been eight. So we find that by using this integral. And well, that top, that's the value that will make these two areas the same. So two is the f average. All right. And well, again, this section is very, very brief. There is really not that much to do. All right, so let's see. Let's move on to, hmm, to the next section. So for the next section, uh, where is it? I have too many here. Oh, right here. So we move on to a new chapter. Uh, chapter 7 which is all about the methods of integration well back in Calc 1 uh, you learn a little bit of integration which is basically the last two or three weeks of Calc 1 uh, number one where is the integral coming from what the integral is what it represents when we compute the definite integral and in terms of how to compute integrals you learn not methods but rules you know like the general power rule uh, what else? Uh, the integral of an exponential function, the integral that gives rise to a logarithmic function, the integral, the integrals that give rise to inverse trigonometric functions. So notice you didn't find the integral of logarithms. You didn't find the integral of inverse trigonometric functions either. You learn integrals that give rise to those functions. To find those integrals, we're going to use 
integration by parts. But um, as far as the methods go, the only one method you learned in Calc 1 was the G substitution. Nothing more, nothing less, right? And in this case, in this in this course, which is uh, part of, which is one of the core topics of this of this course is the methods of integration and we're going to discuss a few. We're starting with the integration by parts, then we're going to move on to trigonometric integration in which we will use all the trigonometric identities and play with them and then integrate those. Then we're going to move to a method called trigonometric substitution in which we will relate trigonometric identities, the Pythagorean theorem, to integrate, to integrate in functions that contain radicals in the most general case and then the last method that we discuss is the method of partial fraction decomposition which is uh, that one is going to be a lot of fun you'll see okay so let's start with integration by parts and well for integration by parts you may think of it as the product rule of integration again we really don't have a product rule for integration and the reason why we can just think of it it's because that's uh, the reverse of, for, of doing the product rule for for integration for the re differentiation well so where's everything coming from well number one if we take the derivative of a product with respect x well let's recall the formula for the integration by parts formula so number one so the derivative of a product is u prime v plus v prime u okay but uh you know what i think i'm going to change notation from prime notation to leibniz's notation which is the dy dx so let me call this d dx u times v i'm going to change this u prime for a du over dx times v plus dv dx times u. So I'm just changing notation and not, I'm really I'm not doing any operations yet. Alright. Something else you learn in Calc 1 is to find the differential of a function. And well to find the differential, uh, well throughout your Calc 1 course you look at this at this sim at this d dx dy dx df dx you know as one symbol as one overall symbol that um that denotes the derivative however when you got to the differential uh section in, or chapter in calc one you stop seeing this d dx or dy dx as just one symbol but rather and you started seeing as a ratio of two quantities that is the change in the x for example and divided by the change, I mean the change in the y divided by the change in the x. And well, the differentials were used to find uh, how the x's change when, or how the y's change when we modify a, an x slightly. Well, that's what we're going to do here without doing any calculations. Just symbolically, the x multiply the x on both sides, cancel the x, and this dx will cancel both of these the x's and that's going to leave us with the following d uv equals i'm going to write this as v du plus u dv okay so we have a a, a differential expression well so in this case this this is <coughs> This will take us to the integration by parts formula. Well, by doing the reverse of the differential. What's the, dif what's the reverse of the differential? Integration. The integration. So let's integrate all terms on both sides. Well, um, we're going to set a u and a dv in our problem. That means we need to solve for this term. I'm going to subtract the integral of v du on both sides to cancel and this will be the integral of u dv which is u times v minus the integral of v du which is the formula that we have in the definition box below all right okay 
So how do we deal with uh, with the integration by pairs? Well, we have I have three points typed in the definition box right here. I mean, uh, well, I have them because that's what we see in that what we typically see in textbooks. You know, usually usually textbooks tell us to um, to well number one. Well, the number one point is true. We use integration by parts whenever the use substitution method doesn't work all right well so but the other two points i find them a little vague well try to be the db the most complicated and number three try to be the u the portion that is easier to to differentiate well that's not always the case because in some cases we have to get the db the easiest one to integrate and you to be the hardest to differentiate because the one that is hardest to differentiate turns out being the easiest to differentiate as opposed to be the it, 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 because that's the hardest to integrate i know it's a lot of um, a lot of wording right here but uh however there is an acronym here that it's going to help us a lot to choose our use and db correctly well it's called this this acronym is typically regarded as liate acronym well what does that liate thing mean well so we're going to use this liate as a checklist do we have l yeah do we have l no okay the next one and the next one until we get the right one well so l stands for logarithmic functions and well we're going to we're going to choose our u if we have a logarithmic function and that logarithmic function can be a logarithm of any base not just ln but log base 2 log base 10 log base 7 your favorite logarithmic function the next in the acronym the i that stands for inverse trigonometric functions and in this case well inverse tangent arc sine arc cosine inverse cotangent well you know those six functions the next is the letter A, algebraic functions, but well, those look like functions that we do algebra with, but well, in this case, when we talk about algebraic function in the context of integration by parts, we're talking about polynomials or powers of x, and in this case, well, these powers of x are not limited to just integers. We have radicals here, which is the same as saying x to the one half. Those powers, those algebraic functions, include powers of x that are rational and also negative powers as well are included in our in our um, in our in our category here the next letter in the liate acronym it's t and that stands for trigonometric functions well i don't think we need to name them we know the six trigonometric functions right sine cosine etc and the last in the hierarchy of the Liate acronym to choose our U is the letter E, which stands for exponential functions. And again, typically the function, the exponential function we work the most with is the E to the X. However, we can have other others like 2 to the X, 7 to the X, 10 to the X, other bases, all right? Okay, so how about we put this in action by seeing some examples well so let's use integration by parts to evaluate the following integrals well number one let me write down the formula to avoid scrolling up and down so that's the integral of u dv equals u times v minus the integral of v du and also i'm going to list the liate acronym as a checklist to set our u well in this case we have the integral of a product of a function so if we if we observe this integral can we do u substitution so u equals to 3x du equals 3dx well what do we have here an extra factor of x and that's the reason why we cannot use u substitution unless this e to the 3 x would be 3 to the 2 x squared in this situation we would have gotten 6x dx and in this case well we could have used the u substitution instead all right however unfortunately that's not the case Oops. so we're going to set up this problem differently 
So number one, we need a U and we need a DV. Okay, the first one that we choose is the U. So let's go with the acronym L, logarithmic function. Do we have any logarithmic functions in our integral? No. Let's go with the next letter I. Do we have inverse trigonometric functions? No. The next one is the A, algebraic functions. Do we have any? Which one is it? X. Okay. So X wins the place of the U and dv will be the remaining part of the integral which is e to the 3x including the dx and that's because well what are we going to do with these two elements right here with these two parts that we set number one the u is to be differentiated whilst the v is to be integrated to retrieve the v function All right so what's the differential here du equals simply the x and then in this case the integral of dv which happens to be v that's the integral of the exponential e to the 3x which is itself but in this case times one third right how did i get that one third well recall that we differentiate e to the 3x so it's itself e to the 3x times mini chain rule times 3. so when we differentiate we multiply by that multiple constant that we have in the exponent however when we integrate, we should do the reverse, and the reverse of multipli or multiplying, what is it? Division, or multiplication by the reciprocal, all right? So, okay, so we have the four parts that we need to set the integration here, okay? So, now, we need to do u times v, that is x times one-third to the 3x all right minus the integral of the quantity v which is one third e to the 3x times du dx okay let me label all this just so you can see where are we getting all this from so this is the u times v minus the integral of v du just so we, we can see the consistency with the formula okay so you can see where are all the parts getting plugged in the formula well the rest of the problem there's not that much not nothing really complicated to do here other than rewriting the order one third x e to the 3x and then minus the one third right here let me take this one third out of the integral e to the 3x with respect x and well all we have to do here is simply evaluate this integral of e to the 3x which we actually already did here so we can just use the result one third times one third e to the 3x plus c and well to simplify this further multiply those two factors of one third that's going to give us a one ninth. All right. And of course, we can verify this result by taking the derivative of this expression. We should get back to the function that we initially integrated. All right. Let's do another example. And well, when it comes to working with integration by part, make sure that you have a product of two functions not quotient so if you have quotients rewrite this as a product so what i'm going to do here is to write this as an x to the negative 2 ln of x dx so from here we need to set our u and our dv the u is the quantity that will be differentiated while the v is the quantity that will be integrated okay so let's go again with liaten and let me write down the formula so i don't have to scroll back and forth between pages so number one in the checklist l stands for logarithms do we have any logarithmic functions okay we're done with the ln 
I mean, we're done with the, with the u part. Well, the remaining part of the integral has to be the dv part of the problem in this case, x to the negative 2 dx. All right? So let's find the derivative of u. What's the derivative of ln x? Mm -hmm. And v will be x to the first negative 1 over negative 1 by using the general power rule. Recall that we add 1 to the exponent and that new exponent that we obtain we write it down in the denominator and well let's clean up the mess here. So that's going to be v equal to negative 1 over x. So we have all the parts that we need to compute this integral and again u times v that is u which is ln of x times v which is negative 1 over x minus the integral of v which is negative 1 over x times the du part which is 1 over x dx okay so that's the setup using the formula and again just to be consistent with the setup if you will how about u times v minus the integral of v and this whole thing is du. Are you guys following me here? Okay, so okay, let, let's compute this. I mean, let's number one clean up the negatives and the, and the parentheses. So I'm going to write this one, negative 1 over x in front of the ln as negative 1 over x ln of x and then over here careful negative times a negative is going to be positive and 1 over x times another 1 over x isn't that the integral of 1 over x squared dx but again we cannot integrate this 1 over x squared while the x squared is in the denominator so for this reason that's x to the negative 2 send it to the numerator with negative exponent and then from here use the general power rule. and well so that's uh, negative 1 over x ln of x plus x to the negative 1 over negative 1 plus c okay and well cleaning up the negative exponent and the negative sign here this will be negative 1 over x ln of x minus 1 over x plus c and that's final answer.